Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm uh, Alton Gansky, the author of uh, about 30 novels and novellas and uh, also some nonfiction books. I'm Molly Jo Riley. I am author of The Unemployment Cookbook, producer of the podcast, and writer of the upcoming location mystery, NOLA. And a reminder to those of you listening to the audio-only podcast, you can listen to us live at 6.30 in the p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, enjoy your evening dinner while listening to us, and uh, you can do that. Uh, best place to do that is, is uh, YouTube.com, but if you want to get those invites, you can uh, add me to your Google circles, firsts in fiction podcast at gmail.com. Now, if you are watching on YouTube, just a quick reminder, if you don't mind, Hit the thumbs up button if you don't mind. Mind helps us out quite a bit. So um, it's a, it's like a good review on Goodreads or Amazon. So that does help us out quite a bit. A lot more than you would imagine. It feels like just hitting the thumbs up wouldn't do much, but it does. So uh, please do that, and we would be eternally appreciative if you do. Now, uh, our ask the author question. Thought we might just jump right into that. We don't have any witty banter. We'll, we'll come up with some, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> our Ask the Author question comes from uh, Michael Sforza. I believe I'm saying that correctly. S-F-O-R-Z-A. -S I believe it's Sor Sforza. I, I'm, I apologize if I've ruined it. Um, and his question says, how do you come up with the title of your book? And I love this question. It was um, a good question. Super good. And the answer is, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> titles just come out of the ether. Uh, when a man and a woman really love each other, they call the stork. And Back the title the train comes. Up there, Aaron. Um, is it getting weird? Okay. Yeah. Um, I tend to default to what Flannery O'Connor says about this. And, and um, she essentially says that she pulls her titles from a central image uh, within the story or the novel that she's working on, an important. Uh, image um, or description, um, and Brett Anthony Johnston says that the title should serve as a layer of distraction, so that you don't want a, a title that's going to speak exactly to what you're writing about. If you're, you know, thematically, if your theme is the power of love, you probably don't want to title your piece the power of love. You want to find something else that's a little more specific to your work, and I think that that can be found from those. Uh, specific images um, within the text, and so that's how I've always done that. I, I had a, a work called Appeasement, um, and that was, I guess, I thought it was thematic, and Brett Anthony Johnston said, hey, you probably don't want to do that. It's a little too on the nose, and so um, I ended up changing that one to The Coldest Winter, um, and using that advice, I also came up with Leaving Tennessee, uh, though my publisher eventually did that short story as um, An Affair to Forget, which is, a, I guess, a little bit more on the nose, but but not completely. And so um, both of those are a, a layer of distraction, but they pique interest. You want a title that's going to pique the interest of the reader. They're going to want to find out what that's about. And um, I think the best titles are the ones where you get to the end of the book and you go, that makes so much sense. Now, now things have come together, and now they make sense. So uh, that's how I tend to title my works. It's a little bit different for novels. Uh, the Hand of Adonai series is it's about the Hand of Adonai, and it's uh, that's a lot more on the nose. But um, again, it's it's one of those things where it's a series title, and you want to know what what uh, readers want to know exactly what they're getting into. So novels, I think, are a little bit different. Pops, you've done a lot of novels. You've done a lot of nonfiction. You've done some short stories as well. How do you go about finding a title? Well, it's never really uh, quite the same with every book. Uh, sometimes a, a title will just uh, come to me. Uh, other times what I have done is I just made a long list, uh, and I will put down the most ridiculous titles just to get the, the juices flowing. Um, and uh, so sometimes I'll come up with 20 some odd uh, ideas for titles, uh, even the ridiculous ones, because I think it's always good to have something to throw away. So mm -hmm. I throw away the funny ones and the ones that I know that no one's going to go. I, I did one that had a doctor as a, a protagonist, and I think uh, one of the titles uh, that I came up with, and I sent it to the publisher too just for giggles, uh, was uh, uh, Bedpan of Death. 
Uh, the other one was a, gir a gurney ride to eternity or something like that. Oh my uh, goodness! Yeah, they of course no one was going to accept that, but the idea was just to get ideas going, and um, then we came up with uh, some other titles. But I do want to talk a little bit about how titles work in the real world of publishing. Uh, but before I go any further, I need to let people know that you named Aaron. You named one of my books. I you did. gave me a title. I think I gave you a list, and you came up with one of your own. After mm -hmm. you know, spitting on a list and tearing it up and stuff like that. <laughs> and which book is that? I believe it was Marked for Mercy. That's the book. Yeah, That's the book. Um, Marked for Mercy. Yeah. I actually came up. It, it was a conversation that we were having, and I think you you had said Marked for Justice or something like that. Um, and then, but it was about mercy killing, and so I wanted that mm -hmm. title, you know, that word in there, and so. Um, yeah, I, I, I came up with that one. Um, one other strategy, just real fast, uh, ask my wife. That seems to be a really uh, proven method for me. She's named a couple of my stories and books. Um, and I, I do have one that I'm currently working on, but we'll talk about that at the end, Pops. I don't want to interrupt you any further. So, Why stop now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let me do share just a little bit um, uh, with the, the folks uh, uh, how titles work in the real world of publishing because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about that. Uh, most writers when they write they'll develop what's called a working title and that's it. That's uh, that's what will appear in the, the contract. Um, I've had uh, publishing contracts for like three books and I would have a name for the first two, titles for the first two but had no idea about the third and they will just name it Untitled Third Book and that becomes almost the uh, working title for it. Now, normally you have a working title, and it's best as an author to not get too married to that because you may not get to keep it. It is not unusual for the publisher to change your title um, or insist that a title be something else. Uh, that happened even with some of the, the, the great writers. They, they had a whole bunch of... Uh, Fitzgerald kept fighting uh, about the great Gatsby. He didn't like the title. He kept changing it till, right till before they went to press, and Maxwell Perkins said, tough, this is what it is. And uh, it didn't hurt him any. So uh, some people are confused. They think, well, it's my book. I, I pick the title, and that's what it's going to be, and no one's going to change it. Yeah, there's a good chance they will change that. Now, I've been lucky enough that I think on all of my novels, I got to keep the titles or something very close to the titles. Uh, I've had on uh, nonfiction books, the titles changed several times. And to show you how funny this can get, I had one book uh, titled Prodigy. And uh, I got a call from my editor, and I could tell something was up. And she goes, well, I, I don't know how to present this to you, but we want to change the title. Well, first of all, they have the legal right to do that. <laughs> but I was glad at least that she called. Uh, and I said, you, you don't like the title Prodigy? And they said, no, we think we need a little bit more. I said, well, what do you want to title it? And they said, we're thinking about the Prodigy. How would you feel about that? <laughs> I'm going to sweat a definite article. I don't care. Call it The Prodigy. And that's how it came out. Um, so if you ever see that book and you see The Prodigy, that was something the publisher wanted for whatever the reasons. And what they will do is they'll, uh, they'll talk to their marketers, they'll talk to their salespeople who are out there talking to the bookstores, um, what bookstores stores are left anymore, um, and they'll talk to other editors and things like that, and then they'll decide what they think is the best marketable title. They may make small changes or they may make a bunch. Um, so titles are often changed when the book is uh, finished. Uh, as I mentioned, the publisher gets the final say uh, on the contract unless you, I mean on the book, unless you have it in the contract that you have the right to reject the title, but you have to really be someone to be, get away with that. You have that creative uh, uh, right over title. Most writers never get that. Uh, and um, then I've already mentioned I make long lists of potential titles sometimes. One of the other things I do is I, uh, I will test the title against uh, Amazon. I'll plug the title in and see how many other books have the same title. Because this is one of the other things that are mis is misunderstood. You can copyright your book. You cannot copyright your book's title. So uh, Mary Jo, uh, Mary Jo, Molly Jo, it's been a long day. Wow. <laughs> Molly Jo can um, uh, write Gone with the Wind, use that as her title, but have it for a different book. And uh, no one can make a claim or stop her from doing that. You wouldn't want to do that because it really would really look bad, but you could <laughs> yeah. do it if you wanted to commit career suicide. But um, 
there are several books out there named Vanish. I wrote a book a long time ago called Vanish, and I don't know, there's five or six other books now titled that, a couple of movies. So titles cannot be protected by copyright. Uh, and then in my proposals, uh, I will often send uh, three, four, sometimes half a dozen alternate titles. So I'll title the book in the proposal, and then I'll give them a bunch of others to choose from in case they don't like it. And it just shows that I'm a, uh, I'm a good guy. I'll, I'll play the game with them. So see if I can make your job easier. Hmm. And uh, that's the behind-the-scenes stuff. <coughs> you know, I would have held out for a prodigy instead of the prodigy. I mean, uh, just would have sold so many more copies, I'm sure. Yeah, it took me five minutes to find out whether or not she was uh, she was razzing me. She's putting me on. And we're thinking about <laughs> The Prodigy is a stronger title. Yeah, okay. I'm good with that. Talk to me. Twist my arm. Yeah. What about you, Molly Jo? Uh, what you both said. I find that when I'm writing, sometimes I'll pull the, the title from what it is I'm writing, just that, that one defining moment or something, especially if it's short story or poetry, that works the best. When it's a novel, um, not that I've written that many novels, but it just, NOLA is designed, came out because of the location is in New Orleans, Louisiana, so it's the abbreviation of the city. Um, I really, I start a project without a title a lot, and one of the books that I have out, The Unemployment Cookbook, a lot of people, not a lot, some people were a little bit upset with the title, said, oh, does this mean if I buy your cookbook I'm going to lose my job? Well, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry they felt that way, but it's actually been a go-getter for me. It's something that's that's unique and, and out of, it did come out of, I put the cookbook together while I was unemployed. So that's how that title came about. Uh, I wouldn't change it. It's an attention grabber and it's good for marketing that way. Most other, I haven't written a lot, the titles just seem to come to me about halfway through the writing project. And in between I do what, what Al was saying, call it the untitled project or that project or you know, I don't even call it anything. I don't tell people I'm working on it, just oh yeah I'm working on my story. <laughs> A blank line right there until it does is titled. And Pops, you were mentioning making a, a name or a, a brainstorming some ideas. I will often come up with um, different elements of a book and and try and mix and match. So some adjectives, some nouns, and kind of do a little Mad Libs with it. Um, the one mm -hmm. of the projects I'm currently working on was originally titled "The Autobiography of Harrison Sawyer," which is obviously uh, can be somewhat confusing because people think they're getting an autobiography when in fact what I was writing is, is kind of a suspense thriller. Um, and so just recently my publisher was saying, you know, we're not super hot about this name. And I was waiting for it. I was like, yeah, I know I'm not either. But um, the, the title originally came from the, the concept that uh, here's a man writing an autobiography who doesn't finish it. And so he leaves in his last will and testament that... Uh, for his estranged father to finish the project. And so that becomes the, the thrust of it. Why is the estranged father having to finish this autobiography? What is the, um, you know, and, and as he starts to uncover things, he starts to find out that the son's death was not an accident. So there's a lot going on. Um, and, and so we played with ideas of the last will and testament of Harrison Sawyer. Um, but I think the one I'm currently leaning to is the cons the Sawyer conspiracy or something like that? Because um, I want to get the word conspiracy in there to to let people understand that um, this is that's what the book is about. It's about something more than just an autobiography. Plus, I don't want Amazon to list it in autobiographies because then everybody would be upset. Um, so you know, a, a list of possible titles, and then I combine those titles as much as I can in in as various ways as as possible. Um, and that's where I find a lot of titles come from. So, you know, in a few um, cases, what uh, wow, we spent. I'm sorry. What uh, in a few cases, what publishers will do is they will add the phrase "a novel" on it. So back to the prodigy, uh, it's the prodigy, a novel, or sometimes a novel by, uh, if just so there's no confusion from the title. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I guess I could do the autobiography of Harrison Sawyer, a novel, but that's just a whole lot of words at that point. <laughs> so we'll you could just... call it the fictional autobiography of Harrison Sawyer. Yeah, that would be intriguing as well. So, um, 
so there's that. There's a little behind the scenes uh, peek at that. Hope that uh, helped you out. That ask the author question, by the way, came in via tweet, tweeter, the tweeter, Twitter. That uh, device uh, that allows you 160 characters, 140. It's 140. 140. Yeah, it's 140, text. and it's Twitter, and you need to stop doing that. I'm just going to hang my head for the rest of the uh, okay. podcast. I apologize. Wait a minute, 140. They've only been giving me 120. Well. <laughs> see, see if you can get the rollover characters. That's what I'm hoping to do, the rollover <laughs> characters. So, well, we are talking about subtlety in conflict today, and it's kind of an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and it's not one that you normally hear discussed when people are talking about conflict because they want big explosions and they want, you know, gunshots and stabbings and things of that nature. But conflict a lot of times is a lot more subtle than that, a lot more understated. Um, and, and that's what I want to talk about that is, is how to achieve conflict uh, but still being subtle uh, with it. And so, Molly, you actually looked up the definition of subtle. What did you find? I, I did because being a word person, I really like to know the uh, the foundation and the roots of words and what you were saying subtlety and conflict just seems to be a little oxymoronic and I wanted to delve a little more into it so I looked at the definition of subtlety and what I found is it is the state or quality of being subtle it's kind of a given it is also a delicacy or nicety of character or meaning the thesaurus joins it with words such as innuendo distinction, intricacy, craftiness, subterfuge. I love that. That's a great word, subterfuge. And antonyms are honesty and openness. So taking all of that together gives me a better basis to know like, okay, so we're really looking for a sneaky conflict, something that's going to surprise you or, you know, jump out from the shadows is not standing there waving a sword in the open air, you know, waiting to attack you, but it's going to sneak up on you. It's why the bad guy is behind the door in every horror movie that you've ever seen. Um, granted, after that, there might be less subtlety, but the idea don't here... Don't go into the basement. Just don't, don't do in. it. Uh, the idea here is that, that um, for me, subtlety really boils down to trusting the reader. Uh, it means you don't overwrite. You're avoiding melodrama. I used to, when I worked at the Citron Review and we would acquire uh, pieces for publication, um, there was a very clear distinction between the competent, confident writer who understood that they were weaving conflict in a strong way and didn't have to uh, beat the reader over the head. Uh, we had a term that we used, in, which I'll probably end up mentioning later, uh, but I'm going to mention it now while I'm thinking of it. Um, at the Citron Review, the term we would use to describe pieces that were somewhat melodramatic is, is crowbar fiction. Um, it's like, she was sad. I'll beat you over the head with a crowbar until you understand that she's sad, she's sad, she's sad. I'm going to say it 15 <laughs> times. And at some point, my head just hurts. Like, I, I got it the first time. You don't need to repeat it. I am an intelligent reader. I am going to pick up all the wonderful clues that you put down. Um, so instead of, you know, getting a bright neon sign that flashes arrows that says, hey, this is an important deal, uh, detail, don't forget it, just trust me to remember it. Just trust me to remember it. So I think uh, subtlety really boils down to trusting the reader and avoiding that um, kind of melodramatic, that purple prose, um, the tears flowing down the cheeks like river, um, the exclamations, I'm so sad, I don't know what to do, those types of things. Um, I, I've got an example here real, real quick about my, my kids, and I apologize if maybe I shouldn't be this personal, but um, I've got my, my son, my youngest son, uh, when he's sick, it is the saddest thing that you've ever seen because he's so stoic. He is just, he will just be, are you, are you feeling okay? Yes, I'm fine. And he's just pale as a sheet, and you know he's going to throw up. And You all right? I'm okay. You don't look okay, buddy. And then he'll just grab a bowl and just blah, everywhere, and I feel better now. <laughs> oh, okay, so why don't you, you know, lay down here. We'll get you some chicken soup, you know, some Gatorade, whatever. Um, one of my other kids, not so stoic, 
And when they're sick, I mean, they stub their toe, and it's it's the end of the world, and take me to the hospital, I'm dying. Um, and it's it's one of those things where, you know, I shouldn't say this, I'm a terrible parent, but you kind of roll your eyes, and you're like, bro, you're going to be fine. Walk it off. Rub some dirt in it, you know? And and it's, it's, it's harder for me to feel sympathy for somebody who's feeling all of the emotion in the room. It's like they're a vacuum and they just pull up all the emotion and then that's, you know, that's kind of in them. And so now I have nothing to invest in it. I feel like it, it disallows the reader the opportunity to feel empathy. And I know, Pops, you laughed at me for using the word disallows. <sighs> Shaking my head. SMH. <laughs> you just said you didn't come up with it. That's a good word, disallows. That's a great so, word. Not that I could find, but anyway. It's a, it's, it didn't say that it was misspelled. It's fine. It's a neologism. I can do that. I'm E.E. E. Cummings. I, I'm okay. So. <laughs> but, so we've got... It's um, one of those MFA ahead. things, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's pretentious. It's me being pretentious. So, um, The next question then becomes, all right, so I get what subtlety is. Um, how does it work in conflict, which is normally going to be um, pretty open and upfront? Um, how how do you have a subtle conflict, Pops? You've got a, a note here about the unwritten contract between writer and reader. Yeah, and I think it'll clarify some things. Um, we often forget, especially as new writers, that there's there's this unwritten contract, and you'll see that phrase a lot if you read craft books. But when, a, when someone buys a book, uh, they're assuming that you're going to provide them with the best possible story that you can provide them. Uh, they're assuming that you're going to do the professional job of uh, a writer, so they have some expectations. And so there's, though there's been no dialogue, there's no exchange of documents, there is this contract between writer and reader. And this unwritten contract uh, includes a bunch of things. Uh, let me just run down a few of them here uh, quickly. Uh, the contract, from the writer's point of view, you are saying, I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, since we're talking about fiction, I'm going to tell you a story. When somebody picks up a novel, that's what they're expecting. I'm going to read a story. The second thing is the writer is making this kind of commitment. I will do my best to keep your interests your interest in the book and make you feel like you got your money's worth. So I'm not going to start off big and then let it uh, go to pot after that. I'm going to do my best to keep your interest, make sure that you feel like whatever you paid for that book is worth it. Um, <laughs> when Moby Dick came out in the, in the United States, a reviewer reviewed the book and uh, it said that Moby Dick sells for 25 cents. Unfortunately, it's not worth a nickel. Um, you know, So he didn't feel like he got his 25 cents worth out of Moby Dick. Uh, no one knows, remembers who that editor was, but everybody knows uh, the book Moby Dick, so he was a little off the target on that. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to do my best to keep your interest, make you feel like you're getting money, your money's worth. I will treat you like a thinking adult, and this is usually where we go uh, awry. Uh, I will not spoon feed you, and that's where the problem is. Some writers are so fearful, fear, F-E-A-R, a false expectation about reality, uh, they are so fearful that the reader won't get it, that they'll be misunderstood and then be disappointed. If you're writing for adults, treat them like adults. Uh, no one likes to be talked down to, and it's just as bad to write down to an adult. So I will treat you like an adult. I will not spoon feed you. Yes, occasionally you'll get somebody to complain you didn't uh, spell it out for them, but then I usually suggest they find another type of book to read. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing is, I will resist the urge to explain. Remember, we talked about Rue, R-U-E, resist the urge to explain. I will resist the urge to explain, but I will give you all the information you need to understand. This is especially true in some genres like mysteries. Uh, it's okay to keep some clues and information from the reader through the book, but you can't suddenly spring something that they could not have found in the reading of the book. You have to be fair with them. So I'll give you everything you need to know, uh, but I'm going to resist the urge to explain everything. I will uh, let you react is the, the, the next one. I will not tell you how to react. I will let you react on your own. Mm. I'm not going to tell you to feel sad. If I do my job, you will feel sad. If I write uh, a good scene, you'll feel sad. Or you will feel angry. Uh, or you will, uh, if I meant to confuse you, you will feel the confusion. Whatever it is I set out to do, 
uh, I want you to be able to react. I will not tell you how to react. That's going to be up to you. Um, I will paint the picture clearly, but not include so much detail that the picture is lost. Um, if, if that really leads to the next one. I will not overstate the obvious. Uh, they were surrounded by trees, elm, oak, maple, and white-barked birch. They were in a forest. You think? Pretty sure they weren't mm. at a mall. They're surrounded by <laughs> all these trees. So you don't have to say that. Um, or uh, the arrow plunged deep into his shoulder. It hurt. Yeah, we would assume that from an arrow being shot into his shoulder. Don't state the obvious. So in my contract, in my thinking, I'm not going to uh, overstate uh, the obvious, I'm going to assume you would figure that part out. Uh, and then when possible, I will show you action and not tell you about action. If it's important action, um, I want to be able to show you so that you can experience it. So I'm going to throw out a couple of words here that come from a different field. One uh, is eisegesis and the other is exegesis. Uh, exegesis means to read out of and it's what people who deal with ancient documents uh, deal with. They, they go to the document and they want to know its context and who's doing the writing and what's the motivation behind all of this. Um, and you, uh, uh, Preachers learn to do this because they're using an ancient document called the Bible and uh, they don't want to bring an idea to the Bible, they want to get an idea out of the Bible so the question is what is the Bible saying or if you're reading Caesar's Gaelic Wars, what did Caesar mean when he's writing this? That's eisegesis, you're reading out uh, Excuse me, that's exegesis, like exit. Uh, that's exegesis. Eisegesis is where you read in. Uh, and you, you, you have to be very careful with those kinds of things because most of the time you're going to be wrong uh, <laughs> about stuff. Um, going back to using a biblical example, the old joke is a guy was trying to find out God's will, so he opened the Bible and pointed, and uh, it said Judas hung himself. And he said, well, I can't be right. I can't. God doesn't want me to do that. So he goes to another passage, and the passage read, um, and uh, what thou doest do quickly and you know so he thinks that maybe that's what he should be doing well he's reading into it he's not reading out of it because he's not taking any context anyway uh, <laughs> when possible show all your action uh, and let the people feel that's more than you wanted to know, know but all good stuff all good stuff um, and yeah I, I, I think that's the thing you want to relieve some room for eisegesis you want to let the reader read into it a little bit um, but guide it, you know, obviously that's got to be done by con contextually, um, and so the context that you provide is super important, and you don't need a ton. You know, again, if you say they're surrounded by trees, we get the fact that they're in a forest. If they get shot with an arrow, it's probably not feeling good. Um, if there's some sort of inherent contradiction, you might be able to point that out. Um, I go to the example of dialogue, where if somebody says, I love you, um, with an exclamation point, maybe somebody thinks that's shouting, like, you know, I love you, he shouted. Well, that's not normally how somebody would say, I love you. Or, watch out, he whispered. Um, that's <laughs> generally not how people say that. So if, sure? if there's, well, I, I don't, but if there's some situation in which you've got something that is unexpected or, or is contrary to the exception or to the expected, then you can kind of call that out. Otherwise, um, just understand that if you've got an exclamation point at the end of a sentence, we get that they're shouting, that they're raising their voices, um, that it's important to them. On that yeah, note, you're touching on what I was really trying to get to with all that uh, wordiness that I was uh, spouting there, and that is when readers, all of us writers should be readers, uh, we bring stuff with us, and if we over detail the physical description, the reader can't contribute. If we over describe the action, if we tell too much. Uh, then the reader can't participate. They're being spoon-fed, being force-fed. But if you uh, grant them some intelligence, they will fill stuff in and they will feel more involved with your book. It becomes mm. participatory for them. Very well said. Very well yeah. said. Very, I like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think of Anton Chekhov. And I, the, the, the big place that I see this is with sadness. People want to show that people are sad, and so there's, again, tears like rivers and waterfalls and every other, you know, water metaphor that you can come up with. Uh, but Chekhov once said, um, that would be Anton Chekhov, by the way, said, when you depict sad or unlucky people and you want to touch the reader's heart, try to be cold. It gives the grief, as it were, a background. 
yes, you must be cold. And I love that because, again, it's going to give the reader the space they need to emote. It shows rather than it tells. Uh, it does not demand from the reader, but it presents for further inspection. Instead of saying, feel sad, it just simply says, here's the situation. And I like that because it allows us the opportunity, like you say, to be participatory in that. Uh, it allows the reader to invest, as you say in the notes, Pops, the, to consume the fiction, to experience it, um, and and it, yeah, it's really important. I, this is I see it mostly in sadness. Um, that's where I see most of the crowbar fiction. So um, remember, crowbar fiction just leaves us bruised and abused. Doesn't do much else for us. Right. Yeah. Pops, you have a Al's axiom number fifteen. Um. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sorry, you moved a little further down. Sorry. Yeah. We could call that reader investment. We, we want the reader to invest in it. So let's call it reader investment. Uh, yeah, Al's axiom number 15, insult not thy reader. Uh, no mm -hmm. one likes to be treated like they're stupid. Um, one time I went to Best Buy to buy another monitor. Uh, I like to work with multiple monitors when I can. And years ago, uh, when I was younger than I am now, I went to buy a monitor, and the guy was helping me. He was uh, some young guy. And I um, was talking about the monitors, and he goes, and he starts to tell me some of the details of it you know, how many pixels and uh, the, the resolution of it. And then he stopped and he says, oh, you probably don't understand that. And there was a short span of time when I was trying to decide if if spending time in jail was worth it, if I, if I introduced <laughs> this guy's face to the floor. And uh, all I can remember saying is, listen, bud, my generation invented this stuff while you were still soiling your pants. Um, <laughs> I got, you know, carried away with that. But it kind of ticked me off. And, his, and this is the thing. He made an assumption about me that wasn't even close. I'm a I'm a tech guy. I've been using computers since they came out, even before there were uh, personal computers. Um, so just to look at me and say, well, this guy must be old, and so he won't understand any of these terms. We do that to readers. I mean, I hated that. We hate it when writers do that to us. Let me explain this to you because you're not smart enough to understand um, what it is I'm trying to say here, and that's how they'll perceive it. I don't think you want to do that. The example that I always provide uh, to my students is the almost uh, example and Pops I, I'm sure I've talked mm -hmm. to you about this but I read in some book it was something to the effect of it was almost enough to make him love her almost period and I'm thinking well first of all I already read that in the previous sentence and secondly it's not a complete sentence all by itself for me, it was just kind of like, oh, by the way, I understand you're not reading carefully, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw this other word in here in case you missed it. I'm just going to let you know uh, that this is what I'm trying to say. For me, that is not trusting the reader. Um, it's that's it's the kind of, like you say, Pops, it's almost insulting, right? It's, it's, it's almost like uh, a personal offense, like you're not reading carefully enough, so I'm going to, you know, be explicit for you. Uh, and that's that's really frustrating. But I did want to talk about one other thing that you mentioned earlier, Pops. You, you said that you don't want to provide so much detail that it obscures the picture. And that might be kind of strange for our readers to, our readers, our listeners to, um, to get, because um, it sounds kind of contradictory. Well, if, if the picture has more detail, then how is that going to obscure the picture? Uh, so the, the example that I came up with was that it's like, having a, one of those super zoomed in photos, you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? That zoomed in so far you can see all the detail and resolution and all these wonderful things, but you have no idea what the big picture is. And so by the time you pull back out, you can see that bigger picture, and then, again, it's that context. The reason we can't understand the smaller picture is because we don't have the rest of the context of what goes around it. Mm. And it's possible to do that in a book. You hear us harp on the show don't tell time and time and time again and you will next week and the week after we're never going to stop that old song and dance um, but too Wait, much showing dance? Nobody I don't me. not in front of me. Al do you dance? Yeah. Um, not well okay. I took lessons once so we'll do the show we'll this. skip the dance I yeah I have I got no rhythm <laughs> I 
I just I'm don't sorry, know. Aaron, you opened the door on that. I couldn't let that one pass. <laughs> it's too good. Yeah, I don't dance except for money. Uh, I'll dance for money, but uh, that's a different uh, podcast altogether. So um, you do need to show instead of tell, but there is a point where you can get too showing. Um, and I've actually seen a lot of the the lack of subtlety in telling as well. The info dump is kind of a lack of um, subtlety. Let me tell you everything that you need to know about my character um, in the first two pages. I'm going to tell you his entire backstory and his, you know, his first love and why they left and all these types of things. And at some point, it's like, well, where's? Let's kind of get to it. Let's get to it. You know, let's get to the story. What's going on here? Um, and so info dumps can be uh, a type of or a lack of subtlety as well, and you want to avoid that. Um, so you can overtell and you can overshow. Those are possible. You know, sometimes so, um, there's there's works that we're working on that require that we explain more to the reader because the reader does not have the insight. Um, medical fiction is that way. Mm, definitely. You read Palmer or um, you know, Robin Cook or something like that. There's just some information that we as a reader will not have. And so somehow the author has to be creative enough to convey to us uh, what it is we need to know without bogging down are overriding and where I really encountered this was working in the Struker books because there's a lot of military stuff and the military stuff they all use initialisms abbreviations acronyms those sorts of things um, you know you don't just have a uniform you have a BDU you have certain types of uniforms there are certain mm -hmm. types of weapons with certain types of uh, things are added and a lot of them just have abbreviations well if you've been in the service and you've worked with those things you know all that stuff but most of my readers weren't going to do that. A great many of them were not going to be military people, but no military people. So I struggle in the first book with how do I educate the reader about what these things are without lecturing. And I know people were saying, well, you just put it in parentheses. Well, that breaks the fictive dream. Right. Um, that's that's the author intr that's author intrusion stepping in and saying, let me tell you what I mean by that. So I developed a pattern where uh, if I was going to do something like battle dress uniform, which they call BDUs, um, I would use the full name first time if I could, or very close after I used the initials. Uh, and I'd capitalize each of those uh, words, and then from that point on, I would use the initials. And then, of course, we had so many of them, we had to have a glossary of this information so they could look it up uh, later. But I always try to put both of them in together, and ideally it would be the full uh, description so the reader knows what it means, and then the abbreviations as it would be used by the characters. And um, that that worked out well, but it was a challenge. It bugged me forever to get that right. It's a, it's a tough line to walk, and I like how you handled it. Uh, you know, instead of parentheses, you could always use footnotes. I'm sure that wouldn't break the fictive dream at all, so... Well, uh, Michael Crichton did that once. Once? Uh, yeah, he did that once, and I thought, man, I've never seen anybody footnote a novel before. And then I realized all the footnotes were fictional. He was footnoting his characters, who all you know were academicians and stuff like that, and scientists. Mm -hmm. And he'd footnote their papers, where they weren't real people. The papers weren't real, but he would footnote them anyway. It was a little tongue-in-cheek. I thought it was fabulous, but it took me half the book to realize none of those are real. <laughs> None of them are real. I've seen I've seen footnotes used as an additional layer of fiction, and it can be fun if you're doing it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, it does sometimes feel a little gimmicky, but in the Crichton book, where you're dealing with academicians and scientists and things of that nature, it seems to make sense. But um, I like the idea of including the glossary; that makes a lot of sense. And when you pick up a book like that. Um, yeah, I may not be in the military, but if I've read a lot of military fiction, I'm probably going to be familiar with a lot of them anyway. Um, but that does present kind of a problem. How do you get the necessary information? How do you find that balance of the necessary information without over-explaining? Um, and I like how you handled that. Uh, I, I felt like there was another way to handle it, but now it's escaping me. So I, I like the glossary. No tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll come like up with the work. answer like sometime tonight when I'm deep in sleep. I'll wake up. Oh, that's that's what I was gonna say. Well, make sure you type it into the into the show notes, you know, so we get that later. Yeah, I'll do my best. Probably put these up tomorrow. I've been starting to do that on Wednesdays, but I'm pretty yeah. busy, so maybe not. Um, now, 
how do we do this? We've talked a lot about this. Don't over explain, don't over show, um, be subtle with your conflict. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of reading homework and you can simply Google a story by Raymond Carver who I believe is the master of this called Popular Mechanics. Oh, It is oh. about a, a page and a half. Are you okay Molly? Are you going to be alright? I, I hate that story. I mean it's, it's, I love that story but I hate that story. So, you know, ahead. one that's possibly worse than that is Tell the Women We're Going. It's another Raymond Carver piece uh, from the same collection of short works. Uh, if you want the collection, it's called What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. Um, and I, I will give you, I'm going to use Tell the Women We're Going as an example. This is a longer story, plus I want you to read Popular Mechanics. Uh, then you can email me your hate mail. That's fine. Um, it's a story you cannot unread, but if you want to talk about subtlety and conflict, I don't think there's a greater conflict, and I don't think there's more subtlety that's being used than in that piece. And so, if you want a, an exemplar, uh, that's the that's the one that that's my go-to. That's my go-to. Uh, in Tell the Women We're Going, though, Raymond Carver writes about uh, two married men uh, at home with their wives. They're getting the families are getting together for meals. Um, women are, are cooking inside, kids are playing inside, uh, gentlemen are outside talking, you know, how did we become old married men? Um, decide to go on a hike together, they go on a hike, see a couple of hotties, they walk with the hotties, they flirt with the hotties, one more than the other. The other one, the, the one guy, the narrator, seems to be more along for the ride than he is interested in these uh, hikers and so you have some conflict going on because immediately you know one character is unsatisfied with his life so you've got an internal conflict there that's revealed through dialogue very clearly the other layer of conflict is this guy the narrator who's along for the ride who doesn't really want to be with his friend he's kind of happy with his life as it is and he doesn't feel like flirting is is okay and yet he's walking with his friend who's you know openly flirting and he feels that this is wrong and his friend keeps telling him, I'll take the blonde one, you take the redhead, whatever. Uh, and, and the final image of that is the flirty man picking up a rock and hitting the girls over the head. And then the last line is, first the one that was going to be Bob's and then the one that was supposed to be Sam's, or whatever the case is. And that's how the story ends. And nothing else, no blood, not, not a mention of blood anywhere in the story. Um... You don't know what happens after that, but you've got a you've got a fair idea. You you know maybe Sam rises up to the occasion and, and knocks Bob on his behind, whatever the case may be. But it is unbelievably heart wrenching when you get to that point, and appalling and shocking. And I've I have seen horror movies before, and none of them terrify me as much as that story haunts me um, because it is subtle. And Raymond Carver's understands I'm I'm a I'm an intelligent reader, and he doesn't have to overpaint the picture because if he did, it would be um, less impactful, less impactful. And so that's the thing that's finding the line um, to give enough information without overtelling. That's really what subtlety and conflict is. It's it's just giving me one or two lines to develop an interior conflict, one or two lines to develop an exterior conflict. Obviously, in a novel, you're going to have more than that, um, but we don't need a ton, a, a lot of extra in a page. You know, if you're writing a page, you don't want to have, you don't want to spend three or four pages talking about somebody's sorrow or somebody's, you know, desire for a better job or a better life. You just need a couple of lines and move on. We get the point. Now move on. So um, we don't want to give the impression. Terrible no, stories. I mean, very well done. Yeah, we don't want to give the impression that you can't use uh, strong imagery. Uh, if, if you have a talent for that, that's a good thing. And um, while you're talking, I, I'm going to go back to, and Ed mentioned um, Ray Bradbury in Fahrenheit mm -hmm. 451. We've used him a couple of times. Truthfully, you can sit down with that book and take out about every fourth line. Um, and it would take out some, and I'm putting clutter in quotations, our audio folks won't see that, but quotations. Uh, around it because it's really not clutter what he's doing is adding a layer of polish uh, he is making something that is gripping in itself even more memorable 
by using uh, his talents as a writer. So in that case, he's bringing something to it. He's not overwriting. He's adding just the right amount of spice and other things necessary uh, to, to make that concoction work. Not everyone can do that. Hemingway wasn't great with that. It wasn't him. Um, he had a different approach. But um, our Arthur C. Clarke, if we're going to stay with science fiction writers, so uh, you know, Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury is just magnificent, but it uh, some would say it was overwritten. But I, I don't know that it's overwritten. I think it's properly written, but it is a little more expensive than most. Arthur C. Clarke had a lot of technical stuff to explain, but it still came across beautifully and it was communicated. So that's where the craft really comes in. That's what separates uh, wannabe writers from real writers is the ability to take something that's difficult, not overwrite it, but write it just the way it needs to be. And that takes practice and sometimes um, a lot of rewriting. Hmm. I think it's better to overwrite in your first draft, and I, I, that's one thing that we didn't mention today. Uh, melodrama is fine in first draft. Cliches are fine in first draft. Again, they're placeholders that say, I need to fix this later. Um, one of the best pieces of writing advice I got came from a poetry professor who told me to um, come up with a list of 10 to 15 different images that I wanted to use in a poem and then pick the two or three best ones, and that's all I got to keep. I said, well, that's a lot of work. And he said, do you want a good poem? And I said, well, you're an ugly old man. Um, <laughs> so he wasn't ugly, by the way. I just made that up. I was, I was mean. Um, Kids, he was mean you to me. But mean. he taught me a lot of things. And I, I think that's, that's, I am mean. I think that's really one of the best strategies. And that's to, you know, go ahead and overwrite in the first draft. And then when you go back in the second draft, say, okay, I've got three sentences here describing how angry he is. I really only need the one. Which one's the best? Go with that. If all three are cliche, find a fourth one that's not, and then cut the other three. Uh, this is really second draft kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times I think writers are melodramatic because they don't know exactly how they want to express this particular character's sorrow or elation or fear and so they go to stock descriptions and cliches and stereotypical ways of describing it and they're uh, exploring, they're feeling out the studio space so to speak until they find the right one um, and that may not come until after you've written a paragraph or two. Well that's fine, you probably need to cut out the paragraph or two that leads up to that proper description. Um, and that's really the one that you're going to want to hang on to. Make sense? Yeah, yes. you take down the scaffolding after the work on the building is done. Ooh, is that Al's axiom number what? Uh, 26. I don't hey, I was going to say 26. I don't know. I just assign numbers as they come to mind. Go for right? a higher number. Go for a higher number? Do you like 112 and then people will be like, yeah, 112, and people go, wow, that's a lot of axioms. He must be smart. Yeah. So, right, say right it again. Done in layers. Okay. It's, what is that old joke? What is, what is that old joke? I'm already saving my second million dollars because I had no luck getting the first one. Yeah, I'm working oh, yeah. on my second, second million. One. Yeah. yeah, the other joke is so. uh, a writer inherits a million bucks, and somebody says, what are you going to do with all that money? He says, just keep writing till it's all gone. Um, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, those are yeah. That's the extent of our show notes tonight. Uh, Molly, do we have any yeah. questions, comments, or concerns from the room tonight? We had both Testa Groot and Mary Ruth Hughes in the chat room tonight, so that was nice. Tess made dinner and decided to share it with us. She had chicken tacos with green chilies. Mm. And she didn't exactly share it mm. with us, but she told us about it. So you know, kudos for that, I guess. She asked, uh, when we are talking about uh, the titles, the Ask the Author question, she said, publishers have the final say on the title, don't they? Uh, she said, she knows Tolkien did not like Return of the King. He said it gave away too much. Yep, that's, that's what I mentioned earlier, is that yep. uh, the publisher is one investing all the money. Uh, you've got an advance, they've got to buy the paper, uh, and the old joke is, or the old line is, don't argue with somebody who buys ink by the barrel. Um, right. So most of the time, unless you're, you know, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, somebody like that, you're not going to be able to argue them down on a title, especially if you want to get a second book with them. 
It's not a hill to die for, unless it's a horrible, right. horrible title. Um, sometimes you can I, just scream and yell about that. But I said I can't, I can't imagine Nola not being Nola. I couldn't imagine it being titled something else because that's so integral to the, what the story itself. So I hope if I, publishers, agents, anybody listening, please don't change the title of my book when you get it. Okay, moving on. Oh, but there, see, yeah, you, you're, you're missing the point. The point is to get your story out there. And if they need to change the title to do it so that they can um, compete with other people, and sometimes they compare them to other works that are out there or about to come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to change a character's name once because it was similar to someone else's character. Uh, and his book was coming out just a little before mine. So oh. my J.D. Stanton books started off as J.D. Reed. Uh, but someone else was using that, so I had to change the name. Well, getting the book published was more important to me than keeping the name. It's just not a well, hill to die yeah, for. yeah, there's that. <laughs> it's not a hill to die for. Tess rolled her eyes at you, Al, when you mentioned the gurney of death. And I thought it would Mary, have been the bedpan one myself. But. <laughs> I rolled my eyes at you for that one, and I think Aaron kind of choked up a little. Mary Ruth says her internet was, was slow, but she was watching and checking in on the podcast in bits and pieces when she can, and super excited about she posted. She's almost done with her second novel, and I've, uh, I, I love it. She and I are good friends, and I go over every week, and I edit her chapters for her. And she is currently working on a Wild West show chapter, so I can't wait. That means I get to read the the um, well. It's not a rodeo; they call it the Wild West show. So we've been talking that up for a few weeks. So that'll be exciting. And Tess says, with historical fiction, sharing the history without sounding like a textbook, you need to be subtle. My advice for that is, as an editor, I've edited a couple of historical fiction uh, novels. I go by the premise that it's I'm a, the reader is a fly on the wall. They pretty much already know the environment and what's going on. You don't need to explain to the fly why you're taking a bath in a steel tub on the front porch or the front yard. <laughs> you know, there's just some things that are just a given. It's when it's really going to be a stumbling block that you would need to explain or, or put it in subtly. Yeah, historical and, novels are always a challenge. I never explain regard. myself to flies. Yeah, well, I never that explain myself to flies. Whatever. <sighs> just, just stop. <laughs> and then the last right. was that I did. Uh, I think I butchered your Al's axiom number twenty-six, but I'll rewind this later and listen to it and put it up accurately on social media for you. Oh, take down the scaffolding. Yeah, I got the first part, and then you guys were chatting, and I paid attention to that and forgot the second part. So I did what I could. <laughs> I think I just said you take down the scaffolding yeah, when the book is done. Okay, good enough. I said take down the scaffolding after the building is constructed. Yeah. I think that's what you said. But I like that. That works for me. We're going to, at some point, compile all of your Al's axioms and publish them in a little e-booklet. 99 cents each. I'll look for the contract. Okay. <laughs> me and too. I think I see Matt Bodell is a, a watcher tonight. If you are watching Matt, oh, really? welcome. Who is that? Welcome, Claire? welcome. He's a he's an old friend. We've known each other. Matt Bodell. He's a oh, man. Yeah, we've known each name. other since junior high. Um, so. Yeah, technically, yeah, Aaron, he's good a for him. I, I I hope he is watching. Technically, he's a longtime friend, not an old friend. My friends are old. Oh, semantics. Well, you're old, but yeah, that's that's a fact. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. All right, then. Well, next week we've got a wild card coming up, and I hope you're as excited for it as, as to find out what it's going to be about as we are. Uh, we can't wait to find out what it's going to be about. So <laughs> we'll do some talking about that, have a notice out for you before too much longer. Don't forget to ask the author. Got another Ask the Author question in this week via Facebook, so I'm starting to get them in through Facebook and the Twitter and the email and and the blog. Uh, all sorts of ways you can get in touch with us. The blog. Uh, don't forget you can do it, uh, find us uh, on AaronGansky.com. Email us at firstinfictionpodcast at gmail.com. If you're looking for Pops, you can find him at AltonGansky.com. If you're looking for Molly, you can find her at FranklyMyDearMojo.com. You can find me at AaronGansky.com. And Heather Luby, who will hopefully be back before too much longer, you can find her at HeatherLuby.com. 
So we do thank you all for listening, and until next week, good writing.